We give you a warm welcome this morning to our morning service. Unfortunately, Esther has gone down with COVID, so the service that we're all going to be going to at Bratton has now been cancelled. Um, so we've got our own service here today. All the other uh, announcements are on the newsletter that was circulated earlier in the month. Um, so yes, a very warm welcome to people here and to people who will be joining us on DVD. Thank you. Our call to worship today is taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. And now our prayer. Dear Lord, thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom and open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance and open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. And now we shall sing our opening song, which is from the breaking of the dawn.
Isaiah um, chapter 42 and it's verse 1 to 7. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and the smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, starting at verse 13. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is, not, what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And the Lord will add his blessing to his inspired and infallible word. Amen. The third reading today is from Matthew 5, verses 1 to 20. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroker of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses them all, the Pharisees and the teachers of law, you will not certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. In the 21st century, many people in society who would have at one time entered a church to find out more about Christianity often prefer to discover this information now on the internet or they prefer to access church online. Uh, but as well as this, through various types of legislation, directed at improving political correctness, which incidentally have been important to curb hate crime and discrimination, but I do think that some uh, law enforcement officers have probably been a bit overzealous uh, and a bit too strict in their application of the legislation. And I... I, I in a, in a very real way, I think the traditional activity of preaching the gospel on the streets has now had to be modified or reduced in order to ensure that as Christians we're not breaking the law. We have been forced, therefore, to shift our emphasis from speaking directly out against society's evils and proclaiming Christ in words, to sharing the love of Christ through our deeds and actions, and also in telling of the ways in which Jesus helps us to cope with the difficulties that life throws at us from time to time. Because of these changes in emphasis of our Christian witness, we may feel it is too hard and too tough to be salt and light in the modern world. I want to suggest today that by rediscovering God's plan for the world and realizing that Jesus is there to help us to be his witnesses, we can as Christians be salt and light in the 21st century. I'm going to structure my message this morning into three sections. Firstly, realizing God's plan for the world Secondly, our part in this being salt and light. And thirdly, how can we possibly achieve this because we are imperfect? Firstly, God's ultimate plan is to bring everything in all creation, in the whole universe, 
into unity with Christ. This is clearly stated in the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians in verses 9 to 10, uh, which Guy read uh, today, where it says, And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one, even Christ. This plan is very broad in context, and there just isn't enough time to go into all aspects of this today. So the purposes of our worship this morning, I'm going to concentrate on our, th our thoughts on the part of God's plan involved with the revelation to mankind of himself through his son Jesus Christ. Someone once said that the purpose of man is to have fellowship with God and to love him forever. The psalmist in Psalm 139 brings out how God has been intimately involved in bringing each one of us into the world. In verses 13 to 16 it reads, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know this full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days recorded for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. With this level of care and attention utilised by God in bringing mankind into the world, it is no wonder that man should want to have fellowship with him and to have a lifelong love for him based upon gratitude. Further, someone once said that a God-shaped whole exists in everybody in the world. This is echoed in part of a prayer from the Alternative Service Book where it says, Almighty God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Ultimate fulfilment, I truly believe, can therefore only be found by having a right relationship with God. We read in Genesis that man was at one time in a good relationship with God, but through disobedience, by giving in to the temptation of eating the fruit from the tree of good and evil, that relationship was soured. God sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to live as one of us and then to suffer death on the cross that we might be brought back into a proper and living relationship with him. Therefore, to summarise this point, God's plan for mankind is to bring everyone into a proper and full relationship with him through his son Jesus. So, what is our part in this plan? Jesus has given us the task of introducing others to him, that they might be reconciled to God through him. Our first New Testament reading from the second letter of the Paul to the Corinthians points this out. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting man's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of re reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, 
be reconciled to God. We often hear people saying that so-and-so is the salt of the earth, meaning that they're an outstanding example of Christ's love and compassion. I am not trying to disparage the fact that there are outstanding examples of caring and self-sacrifice, but the Bible, I believe, is clearly teaching that ordinary Christians are also to be salt and light in this dark world. When Jesus was raised from the dead and then he ascended into heaven, I think the disciples must have felt like their entire dreams that Jesus was going to change the world would have disappeared too. But amazingly, Jesus decided to use the hands and feet and ears, eyes and mouths of ordinary people like you and me to carry on the work that he had started to bring people back to God. He called us to be salt and light, to, the mean, to be the means of encouraging others who are lost in this world to find their true fulfillment in their relationship to God. To live our lives as though we were like a representation of Christ on earth, like an ambassador that mankind would be drawn to him. But how are we to become like Christ as we are not perfect and we do wrong things from time to time? I think a part of this can be found in the last verse of chapter 5 of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians where it said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So it is only by Christ living in us, indwelling by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can become representations of the righteousness of God and so display the characteristics of him to the world that others will come to know him. Further, the gift of the Holy Spirit granted to every Christian gives us power and boldness to live our lives like Christ and even to share with others what Christ has done for for us. So to conclude, God has included us in his plan to reconcile himself to mankind. He has done this by allowing Christ to come into our lives when we invited him into our lives, when we became Christians whether this was by a single dramatic event or a much slower process over a long period of time. It does not matter at all which way this has happened. What matters is that we now have the empowerment and motivation through the Holy Spirit living in us to encourage others to know Jesus. I read a book once called The Tenderness of Wolves by an author called Steph Penny a murder mystery novel set in the outback in Canada in 1867, where one of the characters said, sometimes you must forgo being liked to be respected. This, I believe, is sometimes the case when we are called to be salt and light in difficult situations. We won't always be popular, but if we are adhere firmly to our belief of our living relationship to Christ, we will be able to be salt and light in this dark world and be respected for it. Finally, through the power of the Holy Spirit and awareness of Christ's presence, we can be emboldened to live lives like him and so be witnesses for him. What an amazing difference to the state of the world and of the church would occur if we fully relied on Christ to live as salt and light in the world. Amen.
I can take this off now. <laughs> right. Well, just to say I've had no part in the service today other than to play, and I'd step in to do communion. Ivor was going to do it, but Ivor's been taken with COVID, so we're all a bit sixes and sevens today. But the Lord is here, and the Lord is good. So we're going to come to the table. Come to the feast. There is room at the table. Come, let us meet in this place with the King of all kindness who welcomes us in with the wonder of love and the power of grace. As we come to the table, let's examine ourselves before God. And this is, as I've said many times before, it's not, um, it's not about confessing all our sins. It's about coming to the Lord and saying, yes, I'm going to respect the body. And that's, in, in other words, that's the body of Christ. That's the church. That's saying, yes, I want to walk this road together. So that is what we're coming to do when we examine ourselves. So just take a moment and examine ourselves before God. Are we ready to continue on this road of discipleship and denying self, following Christ, and being there for each other, for Jesus, as Jesus in the world today? Father, we thank you for this invitation we have to come to sit, to eat, to commune with you and to remember Jesus. Holy Spirit, search our hearts. May we respond to your prompting. Come now. Cleanse us in body, soul and spirit that we might walk this road together. to love and to know you more and more. Amen. So, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we're going to give thanks for the bread and the wine. We pause as we come to your table and reflect that without your sacrifice we would face eternal separation from your love. You are the perfect lamb, without blemish or spot, and you chose to offer your body and allow your blood to be shed, the necessary sacrifice. You could have stopped the sacrifice at any time and summoned your angels to rescue you, but you didn't, because you loved us so much. We cannot imagine the agony you bore, but we can imagine kneeling before you now, and we thank you. Thank you for the cross and for your love for us and to your sacrifice. Amen. Amen. I'll come this way. I'll come back to the microphone so people can hear me. Jesus said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. 
So friends, this is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take this in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We'll take, the, we'll take a piece of bread and eat it as we receive and we'll keep the cup and we'll drink together. So friends, drink this and remember that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. 
Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you've set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And if I'm right, we're singing again, is that right? Oh no, we're praying, aren't we? Yeah, sorry. I'm not right. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you for your love and faithfulness to us all. Enable us by the power and motivation of your Holy Spirit living within us to live fully as salt and light in this world. We pray for our BMS partners, Peter and Louise Lynch, who have been serving you in Bangladesh and who are now in the UK on home assignment. We pray for your blessing on the remainder of their time in the UK, for good face-to-face -face meetups and for the building up of strong relationships. We pray in faith for an easy return to Dhaka in two weeks' time without the need for quarantine. We pray for the people of Bangladesh where they are currently experiencing another COVID wave. We pray particularly for those losing education as a result of further school and college closures. May you make your presence known to both the children and young people and their parents and families caught up in this, that they will know your peace that passes all understanding and will have strength and enablement to continue their education at home. We pray for the successful running of the projects that BMS are working with young people's mental health and pathways into work. We pray for all the colleagues and friends of Peter and Louise Lynch that minister in the BBCS Central Pastorate and that they will have good health and strength and that God will be all they need to enable them to lead and support the churches in their ministry and mission. We pray also for Peter and Louise Lynch that they will have help from you, Lord Jesus, to cope with being in the UK whilst also keeping in touch with colleagues and Bangladesh via virtual means. We pray for the nation of Afghanistan, that the various voluntary agencies there will help those in their desperate need for the basic necessities of life. We pray for our other BMS partners, Brian and Jackie Chilvers, who work in Gwynibor too in Chad in a hospital, that you would fill them with renewed energy and strength to continue the task that you have called them there to do. We give you thanks and praise for the safe and successful rollout of the community needs assessment so far and the analysis of data to inform their work in the future. We pray for Brian regarding his work in the emergency department at the hospital, that he will have wisdom and courage in running it efficiently and effectively to your honour and your glory. We pray for Carrie Beckley as she works with the Wycliffe Bible translators in Indonesia, praying for strength and protection as she continues to assist in making the Bible available in the local dialects there. We pray for our nation that you would give wisdom to all those in authority at all levels of government 
as they navigate the way back to some sort of normality in the current situation. We pray for the town and community of Westbury that you will encourage and tell the people in the churches to be salt and light, to help and support anyone in need. We pray for the healing of Ian and Ivor and Esther and pray that they'll all be safe. And we pray for all the ministry taking place in West End, especially for the young people, the Renew Wellbeing Centre and the Eco Church Project. May your presence encourage us all to be obedient to your calling, that we should be a church without barriers, that your will will be done and your kingdom come in Westbury and the surrounding district. We ask all these prayers in your holy and precious name. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. It's been lovely to see you. 
And um, now we will be serving refreshments in the back. And uh, you're all welcome to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Amen.